Welcome to another episode of Mosaic Minds Podcast. My name is Nick, and today we are honored to have Dr. Julie Bosler, the president of Platt College in Greenwood Village, Colorado. Uh, Dr. Bosler has an impressive background in higher education with decades of experience in teaching, leadership, and accreditation. She is widely recognized for her expertise in career and technical education, and she's made a significant strides in advancing mental health awareness among college students. And on a personal note, I met Dr. Bosler at in Chicago at the CQ conference, and she's also, not only is she compassionate and empathetic, but she's very, very funny. <laughs> I, was t- I was telling somebody there at, at the conference that you could be a comedian. It's like, her timing is impeccable. <laughs> 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 so welcome to the show, Julie. Um, if you could, can you give us just a little bit of background about you and how you got to where you're at now? And um, then I'll kind of go into what the topic is for today. Sure. And first of all, Nick, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm so glad that you and I had the opportunity for our paths to cross. Me too. Um, that institute that I spoke at was um, such a terrific group of individuals. And, and I always leave there empowered just as much as um, maybe you think I'm empowering you. It's actually, um, I'm, I'm re-empowered by, by what people are doing in, in higher education. So um, you probably can tell by my accent. Um, I live in Colorado um, for the past, um, going on 18 years now, but I'm a true Southern girl, born and raised um, in Mount Pleasant, Tennessee, a town of 5,500 people. Um, so, and still that um, population today. Uh, I'm very fortunate to have grown up in a small town. My father was the mom and pop pharmacist um, okay. at Warner Drugstore with a soda fountain. And my mother was a registered nurse and worked at the local long term health care facility. So I think um, when you think about, you know, backgrounds and and what I wanted to do in my life, um, I went to University of Tennessee at Martin and decided that I was going to major somehow in communications. I had no idea what I wanted to do. I wish I could tell you I had a plan. Um, I thought about pharmacy, but um, I wasn't great in sciences. What I was really good in is English and speaking. Two things I like, reading (laughs) and talking. And and so I also um, was fortunate enough to that um, I, I feel like I was mentored by people in my town. So I didn't know what it was like to be outside of a small town, um, so to speak, until I went to college because um, I knew everybody and everybody knew me. So it's still that way to this day. So my freshman year in college, I tutored the University of Tennessee Martin football team in English. And I had a professor that said, you should major in English. (laughs) So I went home. I told my parents, my pharmacist father and my nurse mother, who had also created my oldest sibling with a doctorate in nursing, that I was going to major in English. (laughs) My father said, what? (laughs) Um, But my parents were very supportive. And um, my mother always had had a dream to be a writer, so she was somewhat jealous. So um, I started studying everything I could in literature, reading, uh, English composition, but my passion became in rhetoric. And when we say rhetoric, you're like, "Eh, what does that mean? It sounds like a big fancy word. Storytelling, right? Rhetoric. Really, it's just, I think getting to the heart of communicating with people, something that we're not always great at doing, especially today we hide behind computers or text messages. You know, when, when my high school um, age daughter's telling me that a boy is breaking up with her over a text message, you know, where has our communication gone? So I say that because um, I grew up with face-to-face communication. And so I took that path and um, became someone who, did a lot more in emotional intelligence and rhetoric. Thinking about how our body language says a lot about us, or what we say, the words we choose, the thoughts we have, and the actions we take, and how that impacts humankind. 
So that sounds mushy gushy. Um, and maybe it is a little bit of a dreamer kind of statement, but um, it also led me to think about what are some of the bigger global issues, not political issues, national issues, that type of thing, but to really think about how to be a better, a better servant leader, a, a better mother, a better wife, a better sibling, a better neighbor. Um, a better committee member, how, how to be more empathetic and understanding when I haven't always walked in someone else's shoes. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, it, I'm basically just be more connected with humanity, right? I mean, to kind of realize that we are all from the same source. Right. And I would tell you that growing up in a small town, I wasn't raised around a lot of diversity there. It, and that's not a bad thing. Um, obviously, I came, when I came to Denver, that was a huge change for me. Even when I went to college, it was a big change. But I loved it. I love embracing and hearing people's stories and understanding the whys and wheres of where they come from. And, and, um, and I like learning from people. But more importantly, um, as you can tell from this podcast, I love talking to people. Yeah. I love it. I, I'm i that person that talks to somebody in the aisle at a grocery store and um, or engages somebody. I, I tell the story last week I flew. Where was I going to? Oh, I was going to Vegas. I had to, I had to catch a flight to Vegas. And in that flight, I look over and we are going through um, security and the bags are backed up. And so we're, everyone's waiting on the bags to come to be able to get on the tram to get to our gate. And I, I just look over and I, I realize that this woman is starting to cry and it's a very silent cry. And I see the tears coming down her face and she's standing there about four people down from me waiting on her luggage to come back through to, to get on our way for all of us to go to our different gates. And I look around and what I notice is it's almost like a slow motion moment. Everybody's circling. There are people that see her, but they look away, they, or they walk. And that's not a bad thing. That, that That's not to say they did the wrong thing. It's just, I'm watching her. So now I'm focused, so solely focused on her. Right that my husband had gotten his backpack and had started to walk thinking I was got, grabbing my stuff. I don't even realize my stuff's come out. So I, I'm thinking what possibly could be going wrong right now that is causing her to silently cry. Then her body starts to move and her shoulders start and she starts to cry harder and she's just standing there trying to keep it together. And look, this can be poorly received. I get it. But all I know is that there's no harm in someone saying, no, I don't need help. Yeah. So I put my things, I grab my bag. I realize it's out. I sit it down to the side. My husband turns around like, where are you? I do my finger like one minute and I just go up to her and I put my arms out and I say, <laughs> bring it in. Let's go sister. Bring it in <laughs> right here. Bring it in. And she does. And she sobs in my arms. And I look at her and she holds me tight and I hold her back equally as tight because it's almost like she's letting go of whatever it is and pouring it into me. And I say, what can I do to help you right now in this moment? And what can I do to help you in the future? Two simple questions. She said, you just did. Oh, I said, yeah. Oh. So I grab and that her, took what a whole five, 10 minutes out of your, out of your day. Not even that. I grab her hands and I said, whatever this is, it's so lucky you're, you've got the burden because, because only the strong carry the hardest burden. Right. And she smiled. And, you know, I think back to those moments of, fear stops people from doing that. I've been on an airplane where I was sobbing one time, you know, and a flight attendant came up to me. Are you okay? Um, but I think about those moments of opportunities that 
I think now we might be more scared to see. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, I think you're right. I, I had a, I had a, I had a lady come up to me in the grocery store one time, and it was at the the perfect moment because it may have not always been well received, to be honest. But she came up to me at the right moment. I was having a day, probably a month, and she came up to me and she's like, "Can I pray for you?" Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And it it wasn't even about the her the praying. It was just the fact that she cared enough to take that little minute out of her day to do what she believed to be the most advantageous thing for me at the time. You know what I mean? Yeah. She, she saw it, you know? And so, so, I mean, yeah, I, I think like you said, just taking a few minutes can, can just change someone's day, maybe even potentially their life, depending on what, you know, what they got going on right then. Yeah. I, I think that's probably what led me to, focus and hone in on mental health awareness. And I know you you and I spoke a little bit about it at the mm-hmm. Leadership Institute. And I know that's something that we wanted to kind of touch on here because it's, yeah. it's a touchy subject, right? It is. It is. It's very, it seems like it's really taboo. Maybe not as much now as it was, but mm-hmm. still, still a taboo thing. And, and people, um, you know, I think it's safe to say, especially men, you know, like it's, it's hard, it's hard for us to, to admit that we are not strong. We are not the rock. You know what I mean? So to, to have to say that, you know, we have, um, something that we need help for, or that we need to take medicine for in order to have our best life. That's, you know, that's hard. That's hard for us to not only accept, but especially to share. And so, yeah, since now that you've kind of segued into that, that's kind of what I want to talk, talk about today was, um, mental health awareness. And then, also, just because you are, you know, the president of Platt College at the nursing college, mm-hmm. and you had some some good stories with that. Also, and my and my daughter just went back to college today, so um, you know, it's mental health amongst college students because I know that you see a lot of that. Mm-hmm. I see a lot of that working at a school. So, um, so that being said, like, how how would you say that the mental health landscape among college students has changed over? over the years since you've been involved? You know, I I get asked that question a lot and I'm not necessarily sure, you know, I hear, oh, COVID changed everything. Yes. Did COVID change a lot of things? Absolutely. I I don't, I don't pretend that it didn't. I think though, where, where my years of um, being a Dean and a vice president and a president have changed is that perhaps it's not the, the long held deep dark secret that people hold on to. I think, I think, like you said, we're becoming more aware. I think platforms are becoming more aware. What I always started realizing is, is that in higher education, I think we, we tend to be or have been more reactive, not proactive. Yes. So, so think about those two words and how they change, you know, like, Here's a great example, and I, I, it breaks my heart to hear it, and I hate it, and it, and it causes me, like, I could break down thinking about, you know, even in high school situation, you know, you and I have talked about our children, you know, college, high school age, you know, going through this, this, this thing, and um, I, I think we're reactive in the fact, let's say there's a suicide, and we become innately aware of it not, you know, uh, post-secondary education, high school education, what have you, elementary, you know, we become aware of it. And we're like, oh my gosh, there's so much sadness and it should be, and it's tragic. But we become reactive to that and want to say, we've got to fix it. Are you suicidal? We've got to fix everything right then. When really, I think the approach has to be seeing the small but significant stepping stones that led somebody to that point. Yeah. You know, I give an example. I had an alumni call me today. Normally alumni don't call me, but this alumni had a personal connection with me and needed a transcript and had filled out, had paid to have the transcript sent, but didn't leave the contact information for the transcript to be sent. So the registrar had no idea like, where is this going? Who is this person? This address doesn't exist. So the student, the alumni became alarmed, like, I need help. I need this transcript. And 
when a nursing graduate tells me they need help, like there's a demand, a shortage for nursing students and graduates, right? right? So that tells me something's dreadfully wrong. So when she called me, I picked up the phone immediately and said, hey, before we even start, obviously something's not going right. Before we even start about the transcript, the transcript's not an issue. You're getting your transcript. I shouldn't, we shouldn't even know where to send it. But I think you're so panicked you didn't put the address in. So my bigger question is, what immediate help do you need right now that I could take four shoulders of weight off of you? Is that food? Is that gas money? Is that rewriting a resume? Is that finding an outfit for interviews? What is driving your absent-mindedness, your complete stress, and what is going on here? And then what is a plan I can put you on to continue to help you? What That's helps great. Yeah. you? That's um, So I think when we think about it being proactive, um, I interviewed my daughter's high school roommate, um, excuse me, college roommate. And we spoke at a conference together and she talked about how her perception of college administrators were, and I, I, we asked her very honestly in front of college administrators, is, is college administrators want to help, but it feels like they want to help when something's occurred. Where yeah. are they when something hasn't? And that really rang true to me. It got me to the point where I felt like for my own students um, that I needed to share my own journey. Because how can you trust somebody without, to me, without saying where you've come from and walked a day in their shoes? Right. And that's, that's the perfect, perfect way right there to kind of lead into. And one of the main reasons I wanted you to come on the show is because you have such an amazing story and it's so candid. So I mean, if, if you're willing to, to uh, tell it, I would love to hear the story that you told us and, you know, kind of the, the, as you called it, the, um, uh, oh, Jerry Maguire moment, right? Yeah. But yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes. Jerry Maguire <laughs> So, yes, I I love sharing this story, Nick, because I um, and I got a little emotional when you were talking about it. I got chills and I felt my eyes start to water because it's a um, great story. It's a great thank story. you. But it was it was um, it was hard. And so what 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 for your listeners and, and I want what I want to share, regardless if you're a college administrator, a manager over um, wait staff in a restaurant, a, a parent, a church member, a, 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 um, a bunco, uh, card player with a bunch of groups, um, any group that you're in, you are a leader. You can be a leader in a group. Everybody has an opportunity to be a leader because a leader is not about telling people what to do. It's about being a change agent that empowers. Yes. People. So, um, I was sitting in an airport at DIA in 2019, right before the pandemic. It was uh, the day of Platt College's December graduation. And I was so excited. My parents were flying in. And this, my father's no longer living now, but it was the last time my father ever came to Denver alive, um, living. And so my parents came out and I had written a speech talking about for the graduates about how my own parents had given back to medicine. And there's nothing extraordinary about the way I grew up. There's, there's not, um, I don't have, I don't have some story. Like I, I didn't grow up in a, I grew up in a very loving home. We didn't, we weren't, money wasn't tied. I mean, we were middle class. We, um, we grew up in a great area. We didn't have animosity. So there, there was nothing life altering in my life. But what I realized is, um, and I realized it more going into college, I was someone who had to be perfect. I wanted things to be niched, perfect, great. I, um, I was someone who had very high expectations. For yourself. For myself. Mm -hmm. And... I had, um, I'm always a person that tends to have problems saying no, <laughs> no, I can't. That's typical, I'm, imp typical empath. 
You know? Yes. <laughs> no, I'll do it. Don't worry about it. I've got plenty of time. And I'd stay up all night if I had to making cupcakes for, you know, a third grade class, if that's what it took. So I had trouble, um, but I realized that this had been going on all my life. But I, I, I had parents who were very um, highly educated, who had high expectations of my sister and I. And I, that is in no certain way to blame my parents. It's just, I thought that's what everything was like, you know. So I, um, I went to college and I got things done. And if I didn't make great grades or if something didn't go right, I'd rectified. I was always, well, I could do extra credit. I'll go talk to the professor. I'll do this. I'll do that. I'll be more. I'll be better. I'll be more enough. I can do more. Give me the chance. And in your 20s, that is, you think it's a badge of honor. It's, it's And people start to notice. Um, I graduated with my doctorate at 27 and, and became, you know, my first administrative job absolutely no idea what I was doing, but I hear people say, Oh my gosh, you're, you know, Oh, you just get it all done. Oh, it's just always so great. And yes, it, it was, but what people didn't see in the background was, um, sleep deprivation, fear. Um, I'm not enough trying 80 steps harder. Um, trying to adapt to the audience, trying to make everybody happy. I would tell you in my 20s, uh, that was my whole goal. In my 30s leadership, I will do it for you and with you to help you. And that's a control factor, right? And so somewhere in my 40s, I start realizing, wow, I can't keep this up. I, this is a detriment to myself. It's a detriment to my marriage. It's a detriment for my children. Um, my expectations are, of course, you're going to be perfect. Of course, this house is going to be clean. Of course, this is going to go right. The laundry is going to be done. This won't be out of place. That won't be. Um, I became a commissioner. Um, this will be perfect. This My job will still remain perfect. But it came at a great cost. So I was told in my 30s, you have high-functioning anxiety, like, amazing but it's not because it takes a detriment it takes a toll so i'm sitting now flash flash forward tonight 2019 in the airport i'm sitting there and my parents have texted and saying they're on their way to baggage i'm standing at baggage and all of a sudden similar to probably what that woman was experiencing a week ago in the airport Everything, the sound seemed to like dim and people were like flashes in front of me, like my hands. This is what people looked like. And all of a sudden I found it hard to breathe and I'm sweating and I feel so anxious about my parents coming. Two people who <laughs> have paid for every bit of my education, have supported me in every, every endeavor, who have been terrific role models, who have done everything they can. And all of a sudden, instead of thinking the my parents are coming, I'm like, my parents are coming. And I suddenly have the epiphany, I'm having an anxiety attack. Mm -hmm. I'd only had a couple others in graduate school, but I bumped them off as, exhaustion. I'm sobbing half the night. What I started piecing together was, no, I'm, I'm not well. I took over as president of Platt in September of 2019. I always tell my predecessor, he must have known a pandemic was coming. <laughs> <laughs> Worst time to become a college president, right? Yeah. And March 17th, we shut down <laughs> and like the rest of the world. And we were out for six months. And so that became, how do I motivate people? I also started working with a brand new dean. How do we motivate people and keep it all together behind the scenes? And at night I'm walking the floors. Are we gonna be able to do this? Are we okay? So um, started realizing it was, it was getting worse. So I go to my husband and I say, I'm going to go get help. 
I'm, I'm, I'm going to get therapy. I need therapy. I need, I need help. And I found a therapist who was gracious enough in January of 2020, before the pandemic, was willing to see me even in person with masks once the That's pandemic good. started. And it wasn't a problem then because I could cut out for an hour, right? The pandemic allowed me like, hey, I'm going to take a little bit of a later lunch. I'm going to get some fresh air and walk. But really what I was doing is I was going to see a therapist. Yeah. And so I started shaming myself for it. So then when I went back to work and I still needed to keep up that therapy, now I'm now I'm six months into therapy, right? And that's not enough. And so I'm I'm at weekly sessions and I'm trying to get help. And so then it became, you know, I've I've got to leave at 3:30 today. So like my administrative team, you know, I'll be back online like five, but I just, Avery's car's broken down or Avery needs a ride mm. or Anna needs this, or I've, I've got to run to the dentist. You name it. I found myself tangled up in this web of lies. And the, I don't like lying. And one of my number one things I tell my people is just be truthful. I will help you through anything. But ironically, I wasn't being a servant leader by sitting here saying, oh, I'm, I'm just going to run an errand. Um, and then it got to where I, I developed again and had had it, didn't realize it. It came to light. I had had this obsessive compulsive to be perfect and more. And I started finding it in arguments with my husband, you know, normal spousal things you, you fight about. I'll be more. Don't leave me. I can do better. And my husband's so puzzled by it. Like, why do you think I'm leaving you? What, yeah. We're, we're, you know, we got in a tiff about something stupid, like, you know, hypothetically, a restaurant choice, just something completely dumb, ir, ir, you know, irrelevant in today's, in, in, a, in a daily day you know, a snappy comment, whatever, clothes on the floor, whatever. But I started realizing I've, I've got to do more. So I chose, not that it's right for everybody, but um, I remember when my medical doctor, along with my therapist said, you, we're going to need to, we're going to need to help you over this bump with, with um, an SSRI. We're going to need to mm -hmm. help you get over this with, um, you know, Lexapro, for example. And then I was like, oh, yeah, secretly taking medicine, right? You know, I'm a pharmacist daughter. I know what, you know, I grew up in a pharmacy. Right. And I'm sitting in the car and I realize I say to my daughter, my youngest is in the back seat. My oldest is in the front seat. And I think I shared this with you. And every, every time I say this, See, I tear up every every time I say this, it tugs at me because this was the life altering moment for me. I said to my daughters, they're in the car and I had picked them up from practice coming from the therapist and they had sat in the doctor's office with me while they're prescribing this medication. And I said, you know, just so y'all know, like, you know, we don't we're not really talking about this. You know, I'm on medication. We're not going to. um we're not going to talk about this with your friends. You know, you don't need to mention it. They were like, and I, my high school, my senior in high school now was littler. And I remember her saying, um, these are her exact words, Nick. Don't worry, mommy, your secret's safe with us. Mm. Oh, yeah. And at that moment I had this, I, I still feel it when I tell the story. I had this shame fall over me like, oh my gosh, I have just redirected my shame to my children. I have just taught them in this moment, shh, don't tell anybody. Yeah. It was so life altering that moment that I um, told my husband, I have to come out. He's like, oh, what is it? <laughs> I have, I have to make this right. I have to do this. Um, I kept saying for my daughters, but really, Nick, I was doing it 
I got the I got the best end of the stick out of it too, right? I'm, I'm, I am doing it for my daughters, but not realizing how it's going to free me. That's why I think, you know, I thought about, you know, mosaic minds. It is going to take all the pieces of the mosaic pieces in my mind, and they're finally all going to click. And it's going to happen by actually breaking the stigma and freeing my mind. Mm -hmm. And so I... I send a message to um, a colleague of mine at um, a, a national organization, CQ, um, who I had worked with and the event and webinar planner. And I said, hey, me softening it. <laughs> I said, hey, I want to tell you, I think I want to do a webinar about mental health awareness. Now, this is like January, the last week of January. Okay, imagine this. We've just started the, the quarter. And I say, you know, just want to get on your book sometime this year. And this is um, 22, January 22. Just want to get on the books. She's like, okay, what, what do you got in mind? I'm like, it's like any, you know, I've done a million webinars where I've done how to go through accreditation, how to build a better programming, how to do it, you know, how to build a faculty development program, these types of things. I said, no, 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 no. This, this is going to be, let's just like, let's just call it mental health awareness. Let's just say, let's just hypothetically say that I'm going to say, you know, maybe I've had a little bit of mental health and, and just want people to know. And she's like, well, we'll put it in words right there. <laughs> she's making her a little nervous at this point, right? She's like, well, what, I, what are you talking about? <laughs> so I go home and I have a Jerry Maguire moment. <laughs> and, um, and I write this, okay? I write this extremely detailed, like I've been in therapy and I've been, and I'm like, yes, I've written it. You know how it feels good to release and oh, yeah. write something. And I'm like, and I've done it and I've said it and I've written it and I'm reading it. And I'm like, I can do this. I can do this. Click send. And I send to her that <laughs> night. She she sends me an email back the next morning. Of course, I'm sweating. I'm like, what have I done? I, I've given too much detail. I'll call her to soften it. She, so she sends me back. Got your email. We can work on, you know, details and blah, blah, blah. How does February, like six? It's like a week later. And I'm like, of 22, you want me to do this? And she's like, yeah, like in two weeks. I'm like. Uh, you know, in my mind, I kept thinking if I just get it on the schedule, July at that point, it's like months away. Like, I guess I'm thinking I've got the time to back out, you know? So I'm like, uh, she's like, well, you came to me, right? You want to do this? I'm like, uh, okay. Okay. Boom. The blast goes out. Uh, the people I work with, are on that blast. I have that moment of, oh, how do I want them to hear this? How do I want them? So Jerry Maguire goes back to her Jerry Maguire moment. <laughs> and I write that night, I write a long email and I title it, um, the email I've waited so long, like L O N G G G G G G G to send the truth comes out. And I send it to every faculty, staff, and every student at my mm. organization. And um, oh my God. If you think the first email was hard to send, I click send and I told looked at my husband and I go, well. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Cat's out of the bag. Um, and I, no, I didn't do it for reasons of. Like, you weren't trying to oh, save face. Yeah. Feel sorry for me or save face because come to find it, you know, the email had just been sitting in queue, her email. It went out the next morning. So I beat the email and. And I'm, I'm so glad that 
I, I joke with her. I'm glad she pushed me to doing it. She didn't know she was pushing me into, you know, um, but I was glad that, that it all happened that way. So I started getting messages back immediately of, um, oh my gosh, I thought you were perfect. I'm so glad you're not. It makes me feel, it makes me feel like I'm actually like, I actually can work with you. What? You know, the responses were, it wasn't like, oh, I'm so sorry. It was more like, oh my gosh, thanks for being honest. I loved what another employee wrote. Um, can I ask you a couple questions about benefits to help me? All of a sudden. Wow. Oh my gosh. I start thinking, why are we not repassing these benefits out? Every self eval, you know, every evaluation that all of us are doing in our organization. Mm -hmm. And, and that's what I talked to you about the leadership, you know, Institute, we talked about advising. Our advising should be, yes, you've done something wrong, right? To a student, if they've done something wrong, we, we were talking about mm, advising that that's uncomfortable, that comes off the rails. And, but it should be framed in, this is not who you are, right? What's going on immediately? Kind of like that situation in the airport. What is your immediate issue that you need immediate grasping with being proactive? And then what's a plan we can get you back on to finish your dream of becoming a nurse? Um, or to my colleague, what's immediately going on? It doesn't mean you become the counselor. That's not your role. Right. Your role is to say, we do have counseling services available, available with your benefits. We do. Do you need a mental health day? You know, what is going on? Just kind and of I, giving them permission to give themselves permission just to. Right. You know. It changed the trajectory of students. Our students started saying, you know what? Our leader, you know, I went downstairs and um, walked down the hallway in our class, down our classrooms. And one of our students, uh, it was empowering, said to me, Dr. Bosler, I'm, yeah, I'm so-and-so. And I said, oh, I know who you are. And she said, I'm, I'm a senior. I'm finishing, uh, graduate in two quarters. I said, awesome. And she said, and um, I am taking the leap. I'm going to do mental health nursing. Your, That's so cool. Your story empowered me to take that leap and not be fearful of working with people. Like, like we think mental health is, for example, you know, the homeless individuals. Oh, you know, homeless individuals doing drugs or desperate or why can't they get a job or why? We don't realize, yes, that is the face of mental health. But that's not the only face. The other face is a college president who's got a great family, a great life, nothing to complain about, a great job, wonderful colleagues. What is wrong? right? You know, it, it, it says the poster child of mental health does, is not the homeless person on the streets at Colfax and 16th and Denver. Are there problems? Yes. But in terms of that person on the side of the street and my mental health, we're no different. The problem is in mental health with our students, with our colleagues, with our friends, with our neighbors, you name it, whatever group you want to fill the blank in. We can't see it. And we are quick to judge things we can't see. You know, we can see someone with a broken arm, a broken leg, in a neck brace. I always say, wouldn't it be great if you could wear a brace on your head that looked really impressive that said mental health? <laughs> Got Egyptian, you know, some kind of like old, like Egyptian, uh, you know, head covering or something. We don't treat it that way. We don't see the sign. The only way we can recognize mental health in someone else is to assume 
that everybody's shoes are different to walk in and that everybody has something they're going through, right? We don't know that the person um, that's, that's cutting off in traffic or that's screaming or even someone who looks perfectly normal um, eight steps behind you in the grocery line has not contemplated suicide. Right. Yeah. Look, look at someone like Robin Williams, you know, like that was, that was a big one for me. I'm like, wow. You know, someone that seems so, so happy and just always, always funny, you know, but I, something you said though, I think is pretty powerful. And what gives it power is you, you were talking about, that's not necessarily the face of mental health. When you see somebody on the side of the street, you, you gave it a regular everyday person face. You know what I mean? So not to say you're just regular and everyday, but you know what I mean? Like, you know, no, no, <laughs> yeah. I'm your neighbor. I'm your colleague. Exactly. I'm your friend. I'm your, um, I'm one of the moms that helps support the athletic teams. I'm doing the concession stand. You know, I'm just an everyday um, person in her fifties trying to get through life. And for me to say, I'm broken, but I want you to have the trust and confidence. This is what part of the email said, the trust and confidence in me to know that I can still be your leader, but I need to lead by example and not lead by, by deception. I can't do it anymore. And, um, it was a huge turning point. It was a huge turning point in my career to free that, to say, um, I'm broken and it's totally okay. And I, I love now um, to, to end that conversation with the, with the woman in the, the, the airport. I, when I grabbed her hands, you know, my last statement to her was, it's okay, we're all broken somehow. It's what we do with broken wings, right? We're all, we're all carrying broken wings over something, but um, it's what we do with the brokenness and how we recognize it. And I think that was probably, I would say in everything, any awards, um, everything I've ever done in my career, they've all been meaningful, so meaningful, don't, don't get me wrong. But standing up, um, CQ let me come to their national conference, which led me to a, two more national conferences that year with yeah. two accrediting bodies. But standing up and saying, I'm broken and it's okay if you're in the audience broken. Um, I did a, a session with my daughter's college roommate. As I told you, we went to a national conference together because when she came to the house, we're having breakfast. My daughter's still sleeping and she came to visit and we're talking about mental health. And she's like, oh, I'm broken too. I'm like, Tell me about it. You know, what are the parts about it? What do you think in college students we don't see? If you were to tell your president, not that, that she was talking disparagingly about her college. She had a great experience as my daughter did too. And that led me to the idea, what if we put a room full of college uh, career and technical directors, college leaders, CFOs, COOs, and, and CEOs, and presidents, and education vice presidents, what if we put them all in one room and we let, we? I interviewed her and said, what is it that we don't understand about college students in mental health? And then for you to interview me back in front of your peers and say, what is it that college presidents you think don't understand about all of us? What would that look like? And so that's, that's how we ended our year long trajectory. I was fortunate enough to speak um, six or seven times. And I will tell you, my family came oh, to that's cool. National CQ. My husband came. And my, uh, my daughters were able to see, um, because I always put my last slide in, in to say I did it for them. So I went back to them and had the conversation. What, what was that? What was that feeling to see them in the, in the crowd when you're, when you're having that conversation? Um, or did you have to look, could, could you yeah. not look out? No, I, I did to, to say, I acknowledged and said, you know, I, it, I did this for my, for my daughters initially, 
but it also paid off for me. But like, because we can't keep doing generational. And, and I talked more from, a, obviously from a woman's perspective, but not just being a college president or an executive leader, but being a woman, we cannot keep um, placing that from generation to generation that we have to hide it. We have to be the change agents. And that only starts with being real and truthful and saying, you know, you, you have the right to come forward. You will always Absolutely. be able to come forward to me. There will never be judgment, but you should never shame yourself in your position, your higher education, your relationships, whatever your jobs in the future, you should own it and be proud of your recovery from it. Not the fact that it, that you have a mental health issue. In the yeah, and you're, you're such an open person that that had, I can't imagine how liberating that had to be. I mean, it probably felt like a ton of bricks from years and years had been lifted off of you because now there's nothing to hide. You know, the, the lies that you were talking about, everything gone. So right. I can't imagine, I can't imagine how liberating that must have felt oh, after being, it, after the scariness, after the yeah. scariness was gone. <laughs> yeah. It, well, it allowed me to even get stronger in my healing. Right. I mean, it, it allowed, um, it, it helped my growth. It, it, not, I can't say it, it heals you. It does it. You will always, I, I say you, me, you know, general, you will always have dips and valleys. You know, my father died in May of 23. And I remember like, oh, here we go, the grief. But I was so much better equipped to be able to say, wow, this grief's heavy today. I'm carrying mm -hmm. a backpack that I'll always have on my back from here on out. Today, I'm carrying 14 bricks in it. Tomorrow, it'll be 14 pebbles. But just today, I just... I'm just exhausted. You know, I, I just need, I need a breather. And, you know, for me to go and say to my colleague, I think I need to stay home tomorrow. Just, I just need a break. I just need a clarity day. That doesn't mean I'm suicidal or depressed or stepping backwards. It means I'm human, but it means I know if I feel that way, I know what to do. I won't wait that long to re-empower myself to, to, to get through that process. But it's also right. made me better equipped in emotional intelligence, not just for my own students, but just a random person in the airport. Mm -hmm. Had that gone different and she said, you know, I'm good. I would have said, totally great. I hope your day gets better. No harm. Yeah. No, yeah, right? no harm, no foul. Exactly. No harm, no foul. But what I have found is when you are empowered and you have cleared that weight's been lifted off of you, it frees you to see the heaviness that other people are carrying, right? You're mm -hmm. not so all consumed by your own heavy weight anymore. And that seems to be truly a gift I've been, I feel like a gift I received. Yeah. Do it all. Julie, can I ask you a favor? Yeah. Um, so I know that you have to get going and, but I feel like that there's still a lot to talk about. Could we, would it, would you be open to doing a part two? Absolutely. And I'd love if your, you know, your listeners want to ask questions or, you know, and you bring those to the table for part two. Okay. Yeah. That's a great idea. I love I that. I love it. Anytime okay. I can, uh, come on, A, I love to talk. <laughs> B, uh, I think the mosaic minds is um, not fitting in the niche box. You know, Nick, when you and I, we've developed this this colleague friendship and, and I really love having interactions with you. And, and I love the fact that it's open-minded and freed enough where I don't have to feel so like, Oh, how's that going to go over with an audience? I just want to tell my story yeah. in hopes that it helps someone else. So I absolutely would love that. So okay. let's get it on the books and let's. I, and I will uh, just because, I, like I said, just because I know you got to go, I'll get I'll get your information offline. But um, we'll make sure that I got stuff in the show notes and all that, so that people can reach out to where whatever platform you want, Instagram, email, whatever you want, 
and then that way they can, um, I mean, they may resonate with some of the things you're saying and they may want to share their story or even ask you some questions. So, um, I'll get that, I'll get that information from you offline and we'll, I'll get that in the notes. Absolutely. And, and Nick, just, just to end on that note too, if people want to reach out and, and we bring those questions to discussion, you know, to, to the, to the podcast, do know that we will protect your anonymity. You know, oh, I, ab- absolutely. Because that's that's everybody's individual choice to to have that. You know, it won't be well. Maggie reached out from Portland, Oregon. You know, or yeah. Like Here's her picture. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. I want that to be known for your listeners that we will we'll talk about the tough tougher topics. Let's dig deeper. Even yeah, deep. I love this kind of stuff. I love yeah. this. This is this was my when I when I when we I first came up that with the idea for the for the show. This was what I kind of had in mind, and then Jason he brought he brought some of the more like sport athletic kind of stuff to it, which is great because I can find questions for even the things I don't know anything about, you know. So so that's fine. Um, but but yeah, I mean, this was what I kind of had in mind. I I love this kind of thing. And I'll tell you about um, our next conversation. We'll talk about some setbacks and some things that were harder to work through after my new newfound discovery of freeing myself. Now what? Mm. Right. I free yeah. myself. Now what? So, yeah. yeah, I think that's a great part, too. Okay, for sure. great, great. Well, I'll, I'll definitely be in contact with you. We'll get that. We'll get that on the books. OK. Thank you so much for having me today. Absolutely. And Thank to you. Our listeners for, for even, you know, opening their mind, their mosaic minds to hearing more about um, how we can, how we can be just better humans, right? Mm-hmm. How we can just be kinder to each other. I love it. Yep. All right. Thanks a lot, Julie. Talk Thank soon. You. Okay. Bye-bye. If you or someone you know is experiencing suicidal thoughts or a crisis, please reach out immediately to the Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 800-273-8255 or text HOME, H-O-M-E, to Crisis Text Line at 741-741.